That's weird. Hey, Sayer, are you there? I'm trying to get my um, screen yeah. up. But it's show telling me that my screen share was paused. Oh, that's weird. Can you, oh, can I can you... see it now. Okay. All right. I guess I'm ready to roll and I'll go with it. Okay, <laughs> okay everyone. Uh, well, welcome to Turf Insects um, in the next uh, approximately hour we're going to we're going to talk about first the turf insects and then the turf diseases so let's get rolling with the insects and in this slide um, what we see is a lot of brown spots in turf so what I want to emphasize is that there's a lot of reasons why grass can turn brown and die and many of the reasons have nothing to do with diseases or insects and just to encourage you that you really need to, on one hand, step back and look at the big picture when you're trying to diagnose turf problems, but then you're also probably gonna have to get down on your hands and knees and closely examine the turf using your diagnostic skills. So, um, and then sometimes uh, you may be really stumped and you're gonna have to send a sample to a lab for identification or help with the problem. So um, here's the labels for what all of these problems are. And believe me, I could not have put these labels on myself. Um, of course, they now they do kind of make sense, but um, it's just, it's not an easy thing. All right, the major insect pests of cool season turf in Ohio, that's what we grow in Ohio is cool season turf, meaning that it, it grows best in, in the cool season of fall and spring. Um, we're gonna move through these different groups of pests. First, I want to uh, kind of introduce you to the insect life cycles. There's two primary ones before we talk about the individual pests. And it's really important, uh, helpful to understand these insect life cycles. And we'll come to understand that through this presentation. The first one is an incomplete life cycle. And what you have here is uh, three main stages, the egg, the nymph, and the adult. And the nymphs essentially look like small adults. Um, they aren't sexually mature. So that's the only distinction between the different stages of the nymph and the adults. Um, in between those different stages of nymphs, uh, they go from one uh, one to, to another by molting. So the way that insects grow, um, they have to cast their skin, their exoskeleton before they can grow. And we call each molting stage, we call that an instar. Um, in the case of uh, this incomplete life cycle, only the adult is going to, as I already said, be sexually mature, but only the adult is actually gonna have wings as well. Now, the complete life cycle, this has four stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. And that pupa is actually a transitional stage um, between, the, um, between the larva and the adult. Sometimes people call it a resting stage, but there's actually a lot going on, obviously, in underneath um, in the transformation between that larva and that adult. Some examples of adults with uh, that have a complete life cycle include the beetles, the moths, and the butterflies. Um, okay, so what's significant here with this complete life cycle is that those larvae can have completely different food sources. They may be living in a completely different environment compared to the adult. Uh, in contrast, the incomplete life cycle, those nymphs and adults are more than likely living in the same environment and using eating the same food. Okay, so that's the introduction to the life cycles. Now let's take a look at white grubs. White grubs are some of the most damaging pests of turf in Ohio. And essentially what they do is they move through the soil, the, at least the, the larvae do, um, feeding on organic matter in that soil. So they're kind of indiscriminate. What they're doing in the soil is just eating whatever organic matter they can find. And if they encounter turf grass roots, yeah, great, they eat those too. 
What you see in the upper right corner is the C-shaped grub. That's typical for all white grubs. They just vary in size. Um, the white grub has legs, a brown head capsule, and chewing mouth parts. After they consume a significant amount of roots and turf, you can literally roll that turf back like a carpet. And that's what's shown in the middle there. That obviously would be a very heavy grub infestation that's shown in that picture. In the upper left, what you're seeing is collateral damage um, from skunks and raccoons. Um, they like to eat the white grubs. They find them quite tasty. So they'll cause additional damage on the usually the late spring or early fall um, when you have the larger grub larvae. Um, they're going in there and digging in there and disrupting that turf. So damage from the larvae, damage from the raccoons and skunks. All right, this is an overview of the key white grub species, um, and they're grouped by how many generations they have per year. And we talk about a generation that is a complete life cycle from egg to larva to pupa to adult. That's what we call a generation. Those that have multiple generations in one year include the tiny black turf grass Atenius and Aphodius. These are mostly issues with uh, golf courses. The annual white grubs are the most common ones that we encounter. Uh, major can be major problems in both home lawns as well as golf courses. Japanese beetle and mass chafers are the most common species in in Ohio. Now there are uh, some grubs that take several years to complete one generation, um, three to five years. An example there are the northern May June beetles. Uh, those are the large beetles that you see hit your window screens at night, um, like in May or June, seem to be buzzing around at nighttime. It's funny, you don't seem to see those as commonly anymore as you used to when we were kids. Don't know why that is. Um, I want to walk you through the life cycle of an annual white grub. Okay, annual means completing one uh, generation per year. So starting on left, what you have there is the overwintering larva, and that's going to be a third instar. Uh, and they tend to hunker down uh, a bit deeper in the soil to overwinter. And in March, um, as the soil begins to warm up a little bit, that grub is going to move up into that soil and resume feeding. Um, this is a nice big third instar. So um, April, that grub has reached the surface of the soil almost, and the skunks and raccoons are going to start noticing. That's the time you're going to start getting damage from them. Um, in May, June, the grub is going to pupate, and the adult's going to emerge. So this example is Japanese beetle, and as you know, they typically emerge Oh, beginning of July, something like that. And just in the case of Japanese beetle, not all annual grubs, um, but Japanese beetle can feed on many species of ornamentals. So the adult is feeding on, excuse me, it's feeding on uh, mostly woody perennials, the, the foliage. It's going to lay its eggs in the soil and the life cycle starts over again. You see the tiny first instar larvae in late July, second instar, third instar by September. And of course, as the soil begins to um, cool down, that grub is going to move lower and lower into the soil. But in the fall, once again, you could get the feeding damage of the raccoons and the skunks. Okay, so let's look more closely at the two white grub species I said were the most common, are the annual white grubs that are the most common in Ohio. Um, we'll go and talk, oh, sorry about that. I mean, uh, um, switch slides so quickly. So once again, the Japanese beetle, that's the one that will feed on actually more than 450 species of ornamental trees, shrubs, and flowers. The mask chafers, in contrast, they Adults do not feed at all. They are only interested in mating once they emerge from the soil. Now, 
those were the two com most common ones, but there are actually several other species of annual white grubs, um, depending upon what part of the state you're in. The oriental beetle is more commonly found in northeastern Ohio, and it actually prefers to feed on the roots of weeds, as well as nursery stock as in potted nursery plants. Um, if you have turf grass, like golf courses, adjacent to nurseries, um, that may be where you might see more oriental beetles. European chafer also found more in northeastern Ohio, also prefers the roots of ornamentals and nursery stocks, so sort of similar to the oriental beetle. The Asiatic garden beetle actually prefers crops. That's what it prefers to feed on. Um, also more found in northerly part of Ohio. Um, so here again, if you have a golf course, for example, adjacent to agricultural fields where this is a problem, more likely to have it as a problem on the golf course as well. And then finally, the green June beetle is coming from the south. So uh, we used to only see this down near Cincinnati, but my understanding is it is moving up into central Ohio. This is a much larger white grub species. And um, interestingly, it doesn't destroy the roots. It actually tunnels through the thatch and eats organic matter in the thatch layer. It doesn't actually damage the turf um, as much as the other annual white grubs, but it does um, kind of cause a disruption, as you, I think you can imagine, in um, teas and greens especially. Uh, it leaves these little piles of soil wherever it goes. Um, so in the tunneling and the thatch um, can cause basically aesthetic problems with the shortcut turf. This shows uh, basically all of the, the uh, whole grub complex, not just the annual white grubs, but also the May-June beetles, which take three to five years to complete a generation, and also the Atenius and Euphodius on the far right, which can have multiple generations in one year. So the rest of them are all annual white grubs. So it just gives you an idea of the individual appearance and the size on a comparative basis. And the same for the actual grubs. Um, the much larger green June beetle, that larva is probably about as about as big as your thumb. So just a few comments about the larvae of these white grubs. Um, they all have legs and they all can move fast. And my understanding is they can nip you. <laughs> so not hard though. Looking a little more closely at the Japanese beetle, um, I think you all are probably pretty familiar with uh, this iridescent green and copper colored beetle. Um, the, the female beetle releases a ferrum, which is a sex hormone. Um, it's a volatile substance that attracts all the males. So that's basically what's going on in the middle there. They all want to mate with that female. And of course, the damage to ornamental plants can be very significant with Japanese beetles. They tend to skeletonize the leaves as shown in the upper right. Um, now, it's not too hard to identify white grubs by their adults, um, but the grubs also can be distinguished by looking at the raster pattern. The raster is essentially the grub butt, okay? It's the, the uh, tail end of the grub. And there is a, uh, there's hairs on the raster and they all have, tend to have kind of a unique pattern. So I think it would pretty much take an expert to make this distinction. Japanese beetles are supposed to have a V-shaped pattern on their raster. And the, I believe the mass chafers have a random pattern of hairs. I think we'll see that in a moment. So mass chafers, uh, moving on, these are nocturnal. Uh, the adults have a nocturnal habit. They are out and about in the nighttime looking for mates. As I mentioned, these do not feed, so they're quite different from the Japanese beetles in that respect. Um, and in this slide, I uh, actually have some information about characteristics of the eggs that are very interesting. And this is true of all the white grubs. When they lay their eggs in soil, the egg is uh, essentially 
de in a dehydrated state and it will absorb or imbibe moisture from the soil as shown in the upper right of that slide. And in order for that egg to hatch, it requires that moisture. Um, this is actually a really smart adaptation for the white grubs. So when they lay their eggs, say in droughty conditions, when that are not good for the development of the larvae, that egg will just sit there and wait until adequate moisture um, appears, or maybe it may never um, actually germinate. It might not hatch. I said germinate. I'm thinking weed. Sorry, <laughs> just talking about, about weeds last uh, in the last hour. So interesting adaptation of uh, the annual white grub eggs. It's also why um, we tend to see more grub issues in irrigated turf. If we have a lawn that is a little bit drought stressed, we don't tend to have uh, major white grub problems. Here's the raster of that mass chafer and um, they essentially have a random pattern of hairs on the raster. Okay, I'm gonna move on now from the white grubs to a very different group of pests, the sod webworms, also known as lawn moths. Um, they have a complete life cycle, just like the grubs do, in that they have an egg, larva, pupa, and adult, but the adult stage is a moth, not a beetle. Um, the larval stage of moths and butterflies are called caterpillars, and that's what we see on the left there. With the sod webworms, these larvae feed on the tips of grasses in the nighttime. And they don't really cause damage to home lawns and high cut turf, but consider fine cut turf, um, grease and teas might be maintained at a 10th of an inch in height. Um, you can notice that tip damage and that's what's shown on the right there, um, damage from the sod webworm on fine cut turf. What homeowners don't like though, is when they have these in their lawn, all those little moths that flutter around when they mow their lawn, they think it's a problem um, and don't like it sometimes, but actually pretty harmless to home lawns or high cut turf. This is what the, the webworm adult looks like. It tends to sit on the tips of the leaves with its nose pointed down. Um, there are a number of different species, but all have pretty similar habitats. By the way, they call these snout moths because they have a kind of a long proboscis. We call that a not really a nose, but um, a long snout. So they call them snout moths. Um, now they are called webworms because they actually make a silky web over their burrow, which is in the kind of in the thatch in the soil. And as I already mentioned, the feeding can be noticeable in fine cut turf. So that's, once again, that's what's shown um, on the upper left there. Um, also, birds will go after the sod webworm. So the pecking damage in the fine cut turf also can be collateral damage. The next uh, pest we want to talk about are black cut worms. And this, of course, is a uh, caterpillar pest as well, and the adult is a moth. Uh, but this is a distinctly larger caterpillar than the sod webworm, so um, more damage as well. And the black cutworms, the, the larvae is probably about uh, an inch in length. I think we're going to see a close-up in the next slide. These also come up at night and will feed on the tips of grasses, causing injury. Um, on a golf course tee, they like to live in those little airification holes. And they can make a pretty large pockmark in the turf from their feeding injury. Um, interesting photo up on the left. So I mentioned how the females will lay their eggs on the tips of the grasses. Hmm, at least I think I mentioned that. Uh, so both the sod webworms and the black cutworms will lay their eggs singly on the grass blade tips. And that's what's shown. Um, the larvae there shows the black cutworm. It's usually a grayish or blackish uh, larvae about an inch in length. And the adult moth is shown on the lower left. Actually, the adult moths are pretty harmless. Uh, they're actually pollinating insects, so potentially beneficial. Finally, I'll talk about army worms. This is the third caterpillar pest that I want to mention. Um, it is a large black 
kind of bumpy looking larvae. Um, you may have also uh, uh, heard about the army word infestation that we had several years ago. That was the, um, uh, I, I can't, actually can't remember whether that was the native army worm or that was the uh, army worm, which basically comes in on the storm fronts. I believe the one that was causing all the damage throughout Ohio several years ago was the one that was brought in on the weather fronts. Um, this caterpillar pest has a different habit in that instead of the females laying their eggs singly on the tips of the leaves, uh, the female kind of flies over the turf and lays packets of eggs. So um, sometimes, as it mentions in the lower right there, up to 500 eggs in one packet. So I think you can imagine when these uh, hatch all at once, uh, you can have masses of army worms and they kind of march across the turf. That's why they call them army worms eating everything in their, in their uh, path. So um, these are sporadically problem pests. It's not something that we see every year. Uh, typically every, uh, actually rare occurrence like we saw several years ago. Um, this shows that army worm. This is the one that was basically the adults were blown in on fronts in midsummer, and the damage started in late summer and in the fall. Um, you're seeing injury to, I, I believe, a, um, a crop field at the lower bottom. Um, this slide is in here just to talk about ways that you can diagnose problems with caterpillar pests. The detergent flush, um, especially useful in, in fine cut turf, essentially a, a dish detergent is mixed up with water. Uh, the material is sprinkled over the turf and you wait 15 or 20 minutes and it has an irritating effect on the caterpillar and they will come to the surface. So. Um, useful for diagnosing whether you have a uh, caterpillar problem. Actually, um, we can't do the polls when we are split out in, uh, so I'm gonna skip that. It only works if we're all in one session together. Okay, um, the next best I wanna talk about, um, we're going back to uh, another, has a complete life cycle, but in this case, the adult is a beetle. Um, like the white grubs. Uh, the bill bug is a special group of beetles called weevils. And the weevils are also called snout beetles. They have a long proboscis, side of a long curved snout. Um, the larvae are cream colored C-shaped grubs. They don't have legs though, in contrast to the white grubs. These overwinter as adults. And in the spring, the females will chew holes in the grass stem and layer eggs. The larvae start to feed inside the stem. They tunnel down to the crown and they will pop out of the crown and then start to feed on the roots. So this can be a very serious pest. It is capable of killing the turf outright. And that's what we're showing here is the larvae um, down in the crown of the plant. Um, that's a stem that's filled with frass. Frass is essentially bug poop mixed up with digested plant material. So um, we're gonna talk about how you diagnose this. Um, what you're gonna see is these frass filled stems. Um, here's what the damage looks like. Uh, bill bugs like hot weather and this damage typically appears in July to August. Um, it's often confused with uh, injury due to drought or lawn dormancy. But once again, this pest can kill the turf outright. It's not going to recover once there is uh, moisture or rainfall returns. So what you have to do is actually get down and look for the, the uh, damage of the pests. You may actually see some of the adults walking around when it's hot in the thatch or on a sidewalk. Um, but here's what you need to do to determine whether you got a uh, bill, bill bug problem. The tug test uh, essentially grasp those brown stems at their base and tug 
and take a look at the base of the stems. And what you'll note with a bluegrass billbug infestation are these, once again, the stems are filled with a sawdust-like material, and that's very characteristic of bluegrass billbug, billbug damage. Um, this slide essentially shows you uh, what information about the life cycle when the uh, adults are present versus the eggs and the larvae. So if you look at the orange line coming out of April, those are the adults. That shows that they are the overwintering stage. And of course, they begin to lay eggs. And you see a peak of eggs starting in May, peaks in June, and then a little later, um, the larvae. You see one main peak. So what this tells you is that there is basically one generation of bluegrass bug per year. Um, overlaid on the life cycle are the timings for control. So May is a good time to make an insecticide application to control the adults because um, that's the only, uh, basically, it's only adults and eggs present at that point. And a little later, uh, making an application, you'll be mostly targeting the larvae. And bill bugs can be very devastating. Um, interesting picture here, those little patches of living turf are actually turf grass infected with an endophyte. An endophyte is a, an organism which lives inside of another organism. And that endophyte uh, confers resistance on the turf grass. So, um, Kind of strange sounding, but they've actually selected turf grass varieties that have the endophyte because they're resistant to different types of lawn pests. Okay, the next insect pest we're going to talk about is the hairy chinch bug. Um, chinch bugs damage uh, also can look like drought damage. It tends to occur at the same time of year as the bill bug when it's hot and dry in midsummer. Um, but you got to get down and look closely at this turf and in a bad infestation especially you will actually see the hairy chinch bug crawling around. Um, you also may see these purplish looking stems in the grass. Uh, Basically, what the chinch bug is doing is it is sucking on the plant juices in that grass stem, and it injects its saliva into the, um, into the plant tissue. And when it does that, there's sort of a reaction to that, and this purplish color develops on the, the grass stems. Eventually, that leaf blade will go from reddish colored to brown and die. Now this is the stages of the hairy chinch bug. Uh, this is the only group with the incomplete life cycle that we're discussing today. Um, once again, this life cycle is egg, uh, nymph, adult, and those immature nymphs, they are feeding happily in the same turf grass environment that the adults are feeding in. close up of what the little beast looks like. They're actually quite tiny. The little insects shown on the right, they're kind of cool looking. Um, they have that sort of geometric pattern. Those are the wings. And they're probably about a quarter of an inch in length. But this particular picture of the uh, severely injured turf grass, uh, there are a lot of chinch bugs in that slide if you look closely. Um, so once again, a bad infestation, you should be able to find the little beast crawling around. This shows the life cycles. And the reason that you see multiple peaks is because there's more than one generation per year. What it looks like to me is it's essentially two primary generations per year, one in the early summer and one in the late summer. Um, so those yellow peaks are the eggs. Um, the, the red is the adults. Um, because the, the window for the adults and nymphs just basically will overlap, um, you're putting down a insecticide, you're really going after both adults and nymphs at the same time. Okay, so we covered all the pests that I wanted to discuss this afternoon. Uh, a few important terms that I wanna discuss re related to pest management. 
what you need to know. When we speak of tolerance, that's essentially doing nothing. Uh, sometimes this is the best option. Sometimes we really won't gain anything from a pesticide option uh, or rather a pesticide application. So we tolerate, uh, for example, a small amount of injury. Um, the next three terms are used for or rather to describe the timing of a pesticide application. When we speak of a preventive application, that's something that we put down uh, either before or very soon after the first sign of pest injury. A curative treatment is something that we uh, apply when we are seeing damage, okay? Clearly seeing damage, we go in and we make an application curatively. A rescue application is after we're seeing significant damage. And of course, we have to act quickly. And these terms, I bring them up because they are used on pesticide labels to indicate, um, for example, whether the material is effective at the rescue stage or the curative stage. So this slide shows the different treatment timings. For example, number one, the preventative treatment in June. This is targeting not the third instar grubs, the big fat ones that are present at that time. A preventive application in April, May is actually targeting those tiny first star grubs that don't show up until July. The curative treatment in July is targeting the small instars that are currently present. That's why we're calling it curative as opposed to preventative. And then the rescue treatment, um, this might be applied when you do have those large second or third instar grubs. Now, understanding the distinction here really is important because different pesticides can be effective at different timings. Um, what you would use for preventative and curatively, I almost promise you will be different from what you use as a rescue treatment for white grubs. In fact, I only really know of one insecticide that is effective in rescue treatments with white grubs. Okay, um, in this slide, we come back to the principle of IPM, which you've been introduced to several times today, to remind you that conventional pesticides are not the only tool in your IPM toolbox. There's also uh, potentially biological controls for turfgrass insects. Um, I mentioned that tall fescue uh, has some selected varieties, for example, that have that endophyte present. So that would be an example of a biological control using a grass that has an endophyte. Um, some other examples of biological controls. Uh, these are actually commercial products. The grub milky disease is very specific to Japanese beetle. Bacillus thuringiensis, better known as BT. This product is an, a toxin produced by a bacterium. And then uh, conserve, the final one. This is an uh, actual bio-based pesticide. So just some examples and uh, making it clear that there are biocontrol materials out there that are available as a group. Um, they tend to have a fairly short shelf life. They tend to be fairly expensive and they don't tend to provide as consistent a control as a conventional pesticide. However, having said that, there may be situations, uh, especially sensitive environmental sites, where it really makes a lot of sense to choose a material like this because, you, um, because of the fact the site is sensitive and you don't wanna use conventional pesticides. Also want to remind you that there are natural predators out there um, that you don't want to forget their importance. It's one reason why we want to avoid the overuse of pesticides because it can kill off the natural predators. So what the slide shows um, on the left is the big eyed bug. It is actually a, a relative of the chinch bug. It looks a lot like the chinch bug, but it is in fact a chinch bug predator. Um, on the right, the Bovaria fungus, this is a natural occurring fungus that uh, will actually keep the populations down, especially in, uh, well, particularly when the weather is moist. 
And then in the middle, um, the uh, chinch bug parasitoid, um, it's, I believe, actually um, a type of, I was going to say wasp, but that doesn't look like a wasp. Well, whatever it does, it, it attacks the hairy chinch bug um, egg and lays its eggs in there and consumes essentially the hairy chinch bug egg. All right, I'm going to complete the turf grass pest portion of this presentation just by letting you know that Ohio State has a number of resources. Ohio Line is where all the fact sheets are. Um, so there's some pretty good resources out there. Um, give me a moment while I switch to the disease portion of the presentation. I'll take a quick look and see if there's any questions too. I don't see any. Okay, somebody want to put it into the chat if you can see the turf grass disease slide before I get rolling here. Or Zaire, see. if you're there. Yep, I can see it. Okay, great. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound good. Okay. All right. An introduction to turf grass diseases. I'm going to start with something called the plant disease triangle. This is just a framework to help you remember uh, the three factors that are required for a plant disease to occur. The pathogen, the susceptible plant, the susceptible turf grass plant, which we call the host, and a conducive environment. All three are necessary because turf grass diseases develop under very specific conditions. Okay, so we are talking about infectious disease, and I want to define uh, a little bit about what, exactly what is a disease. Um, so the vast majority of plant diseases are caused by fungi, um, but what we call the causal organism in general, we call it a pathogen. Um, but even though it's mo we're mostly talking about fungal diseases, there's also bacteria, virus, and other types of organisms that can cause disease. Basically, what we're going to see is some abnormal turf growth or dysfunction. Uh, diseases disrupt normal metabolic processes. And as a result, we see the signs and symptoms of the disease on the turf grass plant. When we say signs, we are talking about actual uh, appearance of the pathogen. So if you take a look over on the right, that white uh, powdery looking material, that's actually the fungal growth on there. Um, the middle one that's red thread, that's actually the, the fungal growth. Um, but when we talk about the symptoms, um, that's the plant reaction. So when the turf turns brown, like in the lower right, um, that's a symptom as opposed to the signs of the pathogen. Okay, so just an important distinction to make. This slide shows you a generic overview of the plant disease cycle. Um, plant, starting with the bottom um, overwintering structures, basically in the winter time, the plant pathogens are going to be dormant or whenever conditions aren't favorable. They're going to survive over winter, oftentimes as spores or some kind of vegetative structures. And um, fungal organisms especially can survive in many different places, such as the soil, the leaf litter, or basically plant tissue, even dead plant tissue. Um, the dissemination is the spread of the um, 
the spores or the vegetative structures. And there's a lot of ways that uh, the pathogen can be spread. Wind, water, equipment, insects can vector diseases or even the bottoms of your shoes. And when the conditions for uh, the environmental conditions for the pathogen are just right and it meets up with a susceptible host, then that disease organism can germinate and cause an infection in that host plant. And that's, of course, when you see the signs and symptoms develop. You have growth and reproduction, reproduction, um, and the cycle repeats itself. Turf grass species vary in their susceptibility to pathogens. Um, we have four main species of cold season turf in Ohio, the Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, tall fescue, and fine fescue. Um, these species really vary a lot in their susceptible to, in susceptibility to different diseases. And even within a selection or a cultivar of one species, you can see a lot of variation in susceptibility. So that's why um, the turf grass seed business is a really big business. Um, you want to choose whenever possible a resistant cultivar to turf grass diseases. Um, choosing the resistant variety is really like your number one way of managing disease, at least on the golf course situation. I know in the home lawn situation, homeowners aren't usually going to tear up their entire lawn, but um, making sure you have the right varieties in the golf course situation is very, golf course situation, that's very important. Okay, I'll talk a little bit about that third leg of the triangle, uh, disease triangle. Very important, even though sometimes you don't have a lot of control over the environment. Um, availability of water in the environment is probably the number one environmental factor affecting diseases. Um, most spores need some moisture to germinate. And when we're talking about water in the environment, that could be free water on the leaves, that could be humidity in the air, or uh, water in the soil environment. Also, drought, um, the lack of water, this also can be conducive for some types of diseases. So the plants highly stress and may be more readily attacked. All of the disease organisms have an optimal temperature range. You know, some of them, uh, for example, the snow molds thrive when it's very quite cool, very just above freezing, whereas other diseases like it hot. And then fertility has a major effect on disease uh, as well. Um, so when you have uh, lots of nitrogen available, for example, you tend to have succulent uh, rapid growth. Some diseases really take advantage of that. Um, other diseases will do better when the plant is stressed for nutrients. Your first line of defense from plant diseases is to avoid stress and promote plant health. So what do we mean by uh, stress or plant stress. It's basically anything that reduces the ability of that turf grass to grow and reproduce. So cold, heat, drought, stress, insect injury, animal browsing, dog urine, you name it. Um, you avoid stress and promote healthy growth in your turf grass by good cultural practices. So uh, just going to characterize these stresses in the home lawn versus the golf course here. So more on stress in the lawn. Um, maybe it's the fact that the soil wasn't very good to start with when you established the home lawn. You had compacted soils, very poor drainage, uh, heavy foot traffic. Perhaps the turf variety is a poor match for the site. Um, for example, we know that Kentucky bluegrass likes it sunny, so if you're growing that in the shade, it's going to be stressed. Poor fertility, we already talked about um, how fertility can impact um, disease. And also point out that with our fertilizers, turf fertilizers, phosphorus has been eliminated from most of them, except for starter fertilizers. So um, there can be lawns that are quite deficient in phosphorus. And that's a problem if you're applying a material that lacks it. Poor mowing practice, pet damage, etc. 
in the golf course, um, you know, we expect the superintendent to be on top of things, but there's still stressful conditions. Just the fact that we are uh, the fine cut turf maintained at a very low height. You have frequent mowing, you have all that foot traffic. Um, the greens and the tees are constructed of a very fast draining material, oftentimes practically pure sand. Um, you really got to be managing uh, perfectly to avoid a lot of stress on golf course greens and tees. Okay, so let's take a look at what your tools are in the IPM toolbox for turf grass. As I already mentioned, cultural management of disease, um, really your number one move is to do whatever you can to keep a healthy turf, which makes it less susceptible to disease. Number two, use disease resistant varieties whenever possible. Um, the North, Northern Turf Grass Evaluation Program trials, NTEP trials, um, this is where the action takes place in selecting uh, turf grass for different parts of the country. Um, if you are ever establishing a new turf, you're going to want to make sure you choose something with resistance that does well in your part of the country. Biological controls, sadly, um, for turf grass diseases, we really don't have effective uh, biological materials. And then finally, there's fungicides and sometimes no action is the appropriate move. I'm gonna look at these different tools in the toolbox and what do we mean by cultural controls, proper mowing, fertilization, irrigation, thatch management, core aeration, and whatever you can do to improve air circulation and good drainage. This is gonna help make uh, the environment less conducive for diseases. What about fungicides? Okay, I'm gonna make a case that fungicides are a very important tool for managing disease on golf courses and high value turf, but much less so for residential lawns. Um, in order to use fungicides properly, first of all, you have to correctly identify the disease. And this is not always an easy thing. Um, your average homeowner, actually your average lawn care uh, person, technician is probably not going to be able to correctly identify diseases. There's a lot of, um, basically a lot of experience involved in properly identifying diseases. If you are going to approach disease ID, you need to know what species you're dealing with. You need to know the environmental conditions that the disease developed under, you need to know the signs and symptoms, and oftentimes you'll still have to send out the samples to the lab to get a proper diagnosis. With fungicides, application timing is absolutely critical. Most of them are effective when applied preventatively. So that means you actually have to get the material on before the disease is even present or before it has significantly um, developed. Even early curative applications with fungicides are less effective. And just be aware if you are uh, making an early curative application as opposed to a preventive application, you're gonna need to use the higher labeled rates. And then finally, you need very good coverage uh, with fungicide applications. As long as the environmental conditions are conducive for disease, you're gonna need to be applying the fungicide on uh, the intervals that you're allowed by the pesticide label. Oftentimes it's every two weeks or every four weeks, something like that. Now, um, many of the fungicides are pretty expensive. I, I talked to a golf course superintendent. It has been a number of years, but I asked him how much it cost for him to spray his greens, greens and teas. And he told me that it was several thousand dollars for one application to his greens and teas. This is an 18 hole golf course. So um, I'm trying to underscore here that these aren't materials that we're going to be blanketing home lawns for, uh, home lawns with. It's just one, uh, an expensive application and it's not gonna work unless it's timed just right. Also, um, with uh, these fungicides, uh, 
especially in golf course situations, we encounter problems with resistance because they are used a lot on golf courses. And I'll just remind you how you manage resistance. Uh, you want to use the full labeled rates, apply the materials at the proper intervals. So if it says uh, apply every two weeks, don't apply it every four weeks because uh, you're just not using it properly. You're going to allow the uh, resistant uh, disease organisms to, to uh, multiply if you don't apply it often enough. Um, avoid over-reliance on one chemical mode of action. You want to rotate or take mix several effective, sorry, it says herbicide. It should be fungicide <laughs> modes of action. So everything we talked about in the previous hour also applies to fungicides. Um, I want to take a moment to explain how a fungal infection occurs through a series of slides. Um, it sort of explains why you have to use fungicides uh, preventively or early curatively. So this is actually a, a leaf sandwich. Don't worry about all of the terms in this slide. What I'm showing you is a cross section of leaf. So it's the top of the leaf, uh, that's the cuticle and the bottom of the leaf. and uh, a fungal infection, uh, the preliminary step is having a fungal spore land on the surface of the leaf. And you have the susceptible host and you have the pathogen here, but you have to have the suitable environment. And in this case, it might be uh, leaf moisture. So some level of moisture has to be present on that leaf. And if the environmental conditions are just right, the spore will germinate and it will grow and infect the, uh, the turf grass leaf. We call this a host parasite relationship. So what it's doing is it is growing inside of the leaf and it's uh, using the fungus. Uh, I mean, the fungus is uh, essentially obtaining nutrients from that host plant. And after a while, um, the host plant starts to die and you will then see the symptoms on the leaf. This is dollar spot as an example. So um, just to give you an idea how the infection process takes place. Now, what about using fungicides on residential turf? I've already kind of go, gone through some of the reasons why this is typically not done. It's not gonna be a typical residential lawn practice, maybe a very high value um, residential property. Um, many turf diseases are exceedingly difficult to identify. So the average lawn technician is, is not going to be able to distinguish. Um, it's too difficult to get the proper timing when you visit lawns on a, say, every six-week basis. Um, you're just not going to be able to make that application preventatively or at early curative at the latest. And there's the expense of fungicides. They are not um, cheap materials. So I come back to the claim that good turf management is really your first defense in home lawns against uh, diseases, not fungicides. Here's a checklist of things to consider when you are trying to identify turf grass diseases. Uh, kind of already went through these once, but once again, um, we're going to see as we go through a group of diseases in the next section that they occur at certain times a year. They occur under specific environmental conditions. They tend to attack uh, one type or species of turf grass more than others. They will uh, infect certain sections of the grass plant, stems, crowns, roots, and then you will see specific symptoms and signs and symptoms. And just a reminder, just like we said for the insects, that all brown spots on turf are not caused by diseases. So there can be many, many reasons why. Um, some of these are pretty funky. Uh, the top center is actually uh, frost damage. Frost damage can look very strange. Um, the, the middle slide um, bottom is actually lightning injury. Um, bottom right, somebody went crazy with a can of Roundup. So at any rate, uh, and I think that is 
probably cutworm injury on the lower left. Now we're going to go through some of the more common diseases in Ohio lawn, starting with the three most common lawn diseases in Ohio, according to our recently retired turf grass pathologist, red thread, dollar spot, and rust. So the good news about these is that all of these are foliar diseases. And what I mean by that is they attack the leaf blade, but they don't move down into the crowns and root systems. So that means they don't actually kill the turf. They can make it look really bad, but um, your turf can grow out of these diseases. Also, maintaining good fertility and good growth of the turf helps control these diseases. So the, whatever cultural practices um, that maintain good growth of the turf will help control the diseases. Starting with rust, um, another thing about these is they're, these aren't as difficult to control as some of the other diseases I'm going to talk about. Rust actually is easy to control when this is sporulating because um, the rust organism will make these pustules on the leaf blade that burst and release orange colored spores. And literally you can walk through with white tennis shoes and you can um, see the orange spores all over your shoes. Um, rust, uh, this, the conditions that are conducive for rust include moderate temperatures of spring or fall, nitrogen deficient or slow growing turf, a combination of wet foliage and dry soil. So you have adequate moisture for the spores to germinate in the foliar or the canopy, but the turf is stressed um, and the root system is stressed by drought and also shady conditions. Um, this occurs primarily on perennial ryegrass as well. Red thread, um, also a disease uh, when the organism is present, you can readily identify it because you will see these pinkish um, mycelial threads growing between the dying leaf blades. Um, that pinkish growth is actually the fungal growth. Um, fungi grow in chains called mycelia, so thread-like growth. The types of conditions that are conducive for red thread are prolonged wet periods when it's cool and overcast for long periods of time. And this one predominantly affects Kentucky bluegrass. Dollar spot, what I understand is the number one turf grass disease worldwide. It's very common. Um, this one often comes on strong when the summer temperatures really start becoming warm, like in late June. Um, early summer, warm days, but coupled with cool nights. So what happens when you have cool nights and warm days, you tend to get dew on the leaves. It's that presence of free moisture on the leaves that will cause the germination of the pathogen. Also, um, turf that is stressed by uh, deficiencies, low fertility, will be more susceptible. This affects bluegrass and bent grasses especially. The symptoms on the leaves are shown in the upper left. That's a classic dollar spot lesion. I'm not sure why. People call that an hourglass shape. I think you can kind of imagine that. But you, the lesion will um, completely girdle or go across the entire leaf and you will see those two edges, the darker brown edges and the um, kind of straw colored tissue in the middle. In the very early morning when the dew is still on the leaves, you might actually be able to see the living organism that's shown on the left. So those um, kind of, uh, what shall we say, uh, cottony chains of growth, the cottony material, that is actually the fungus. And on the right side, um, you can see the lesions on the leaf. Uh, that's what the disease looks like in shortcut turf on the upper right, all the little patches. Actually, that would be the rough. That would be the, the higher cut turf. Um, here's a good picture of what dollar spot looks like in short cut turf or fine cut turf, uh, greens and teas. So I think you can see why they call it dollar spot because it makes uh, all of these small discrete spots, eventually they will start to coalesce when you have a bad inf infestation.
To manage dollar spot, um, you want to choose resistant varieties whenever possible. You want to keep your fertility up. Um, make sure the leaves dry before sunset. Golf courses will even roll or drag the turf in the mornings to remove the dew. And of course, prevented fungicides. Golf courses use a lot of fungicides on a scheduled basis to combat dollar spot. And we're not going to do a poll. We're going to move on. Um, now I'm going to talk about diseases, the rest of the diseases. Um, we're going to start with the early season or even the winter time um, through the heat of the summer. So kind of do the diseases in that order. Pink snow mold actually will occur under the cover of snow. It likes very cool conditions, all that moisture that would be under a snow layer. So this is a disease that's going to be a problem in years where you have appreciable snow cover. Pink snow mold is just one species. There's also uh, gray snow mold. And uh, golf courses will make applications in the fall for this because obviously there's not much you can do during the time of snow cover. Um, if there is a significant problem, you're not going to know it until the snow melts. This is particularly a problem on creeping bent grass. Now, leaf spot diseases are issues in both golf courses and home lawns. It's a very common disease. And actually, there are several different pathogens that can cause this. Um, cool, wet springs. Um, basically, all cool season turf species, but Kentucky bluegrass uh, tends to be nailed the worst. And you see these small uh, lesions in the turf grass that will eventually take out the entire blade. The entire blade of grass will tur turn brown. Um, I'm talking about the cool season leaf spot, but actually there's a pathogen that will, um, will cause similar symptoms in the warmer parts of the summer as well, as long as it's very moist. Now, the leaf spot can develop into a phase called melting out, so the same pathogen. What happens is that the pathogen first attacks the leaves, causing the leaf spot, but then it will move down into the crowns and then attack the root system and basically kill the entire plant. And that's, we call it melting out because the turf sim simply melts away or dies in irregular pa patches. So this is gonna occur a little later in the season and can be confused with drought stress. Pretty hard to do anything uh, once you have a situation shown in the slide. The next disease is powdery mildew. Um, this one isn't too difficult to diagnose because the powdery white fungal material is, is pretty obvious. <coughs> Excuse me. So powdery mildew is favored by high humidity, shady conditions, cool nights in areas of poor air circulation like under trees and shrubs. Kentucky bluegrass, of course, does best in full sun and it's going to be more prone to diseases in, in, when it's grown in stressful conditions. Excuse me just a second. I'm going to get a little sip of water here. Okay, the next two diseases are summer patch and necrotic ring patch. These have very similar uh, appearing symptoms on turf grass, but they appear at very different times of year. One when it's cool, uh, one when it's uh, quite warm in the summer. So summer patch, as the name implies, that's the one that occurs when it's warm. Um, other than the time of year and the, the uh, temperature, the other uh, conducive conditions are very similar. So when you have a lot of moisture, heavy rains, you have poorly drained soil, a lot of thatch, um, both of these diseases will tend to be a problem. Uh, once again, either in the spring when it's cool or summer when you have higher temperatures. So um, you'll get that unusual round 
circle, eventually that whole area will turn brown and die. These patches are typically 18 to 24 inches in diameter. Now, brown patch is a disease that usually appears, uh, at least in central Ohio, like in late July. So later in the summer, when you have high moisture conditions, high humidity, uh, day temperatures in the upper 80s and 90s, uh, the night temperatures, though, still moderate. Tall fescue is most susceptible, um, although all varieties can get brown patch. When you see in the upper right there, um, you see the actual organism, you see the cottony white growth. And on the right, you have a look at what the lesions on the leaves look like. And you will see these uh, initially kind of water soaked looking patches, the turf looks a little bit off color, and then it will turn brown and the patch will get larger and larger. And the, the living organism in a patch disease is always going to be on the outer um, basically the outer portion of the ring. It's moving outward towards um, newer grass, newer living grass. So that's why the, um, it gets bigger and bigger as the fungus uh, advances. The next disease is Pythium blight. Uh, Pythium likes both hot days and hot nights. So it, it loves it hot and when it's very wet. So in August, if we would happen to get a lot of rain and be very humid and hot, that would be perfect conditions for Pythium. Also, um, coupled with poor drainage, that also makes the conditions very conducive. On the upper left there, you see kind of a grayish cottony material. That's the Pythium organism. Uh, one of the things about Pythium is it kills the turf very rapidly and just basically in a fairly short period of time, just leaves bare ground in its wake. So it's a fast killing disease. Fairy ring um, is really, in a sense, not a turf pathogen at all. The fairy rings are fungi which live on decaying organic matter in the soil. And a reason you see them in uh, circles sometimes, or really oftentimes, uh, for example, think of a uh, decaying trunk or decaying uh, stump. The fungal organisms are growing outward from that source of organic matter, looking for new uh, decaying organic matter to exploit. Now, is it infesting the turf or not? No, it's not. But what's, uh, what's under the ground is a dense mat of fungal growth, and it changes the water relations in the soil, actually um, can make the soil hard to for the moisture to penetrate. Uh, that fungal growth kind of repels moisture. So your turf starts to suffer. Uh, bottom line, the, sur the turf starts to suffer wherever you have these fairy rings. Um, I've seen experiments where they've tried to control fairy greens with uh, fairy rings with fungicide applications, and honestly, I have not seen uh, very good results. So, I'm not sure what the um, to recommend doing, um, other than just trying to make sure that the turf gets adequate um, irrigation. Um, perhaps going in and dethatching later in the year might help. Uh, oh, so, so what stimulates fairy rings? Well, lots of rainfall when it's warm. Um, it affects all varieties of turf grass because it's not actually attacking the turf grass. It's just changing the env soil environment. Okay, sort of a final summary that um, to help combat disease, you need to promote healthy turf grass through proper fertility, uh, irrigation, uh, good drainage in the soil, uh, proper mowing heights, doing whatever you can to reduce compaction in the soil, managing the thatch. Um, most brown turf is not a result of disease. If you do think you have a disease on hand and you want to uh, just, uh, make a treatment, make sure you identify that disease properly before you make a fungicide application, get help if you need it. And that's my final slide is where you can get help with turf and pest diagnosis. Um, 
rather turf disease and pest diagnosis. So now at Ohio State, the samples are sent directly to Todd Hicks at the OSU Turf Grass Center. So this ad, uh, web address here basically has the instructions for sending him uh, turf grass samples. And that is it for the afternoon program. I'm going to take a look and see if you've got any questions in the chat or even if you want to unmute yourself at this point, I really don't mind. Um, otherwise, if you're finished for the day, good luck on your Category 8 exam.